Support for Conversations with Elle McFarland was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest today is Elsa Vega Perez. She's founder of uh, uh, El Fondo. El Fondo Boricua supports uh, the uh, recovery from the uh, hurricane in Puerto Rico. Elsa, first of all, thank you for your work. Thank you for being Elsa, and thank you for being here. My pleasure, Alan. Talk about what's going on. What's the update on the recovery relief and the re, uh, restoration Absolutely. that people are experiencing at home in Puerto Rico? Absolutely. Well, you know, since Hurricane Maria, um, the devastation was a type, you know, 0.5 hurricane, and it just devastated the island. The political unrest did not occur. Um, the FEMA tensions and all of the issues that help in the restoration of a community mm -hmm. of citizens of this country were not met. Um, FEMA had regulations that did not um, actually meet the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, um, it, it also happened in, in Katrina in, in New Orleans, New Orleans right. when those homes were left for uh, their families, ancestry bought the property or earned the property, and those papers and those documents are missing. Mm -hmm. And FEMA needed those in order to comply with their requirements. So mm -hmm. those homes were not serviced, mm -hmm. they were left alone. So our recovery efforts were focused on immediate relief efforts, getting lights, getting water, and food. getting food. Yeah. And then once those were met and as much as they could be met, we started looking at infrastructure and looking at some of the communities inside the internal part of the island. The, mm -hmm. Those were the ones that were really suffering. They were underreported yes. all the way through. I mean, uh, nobody seemed to care or at least take the time to document the tremendous suffering exactly. that occurred away from the coastline. Exactly. Yeah. You've got that right. It was all the... Um, surrounding San Juan, the more prosperous sure. areas of the island yeah. uh, where privatization mm -hmm. is taking place. Mm -hmm. And those people in the communities, mm -hmm. in those hard written communities were left alone. Mm -hmm. So that's when we became uh, more actively involved. We were able to mobilize a lot of the Congress in making sure that our stuff got through. Melissa Franson, our senator, she's Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. she got involved. Um, and then also organizations out of New York City, which we're more familiar with because I'm from there, we worked together to get some stuff into the island. But it was it was just a challenge in the early stages of the of the season. You went there early on. Yes, we went um, after we well the foundation started receiving a great deal of money and we invested over three hundred thousand dollars on these efforts mm -hmm. so we said let's go and see where our money is being spent yes. so once the it, it became more accessible for us to travel mm -hmm. we did go out there and we saw the work that we were doing was just really really good work foundations that were being formed by communities themselves uh, organizing i mean you could see the real specialty of the community of the people in the island and how they were really building efforts to succeed and move forward. When you got there, what were the first impressions you had? What, what did you think on your way, first of all? Because all of us were looking at the horrors mm -hmm. of the experience on TV, watching mm -hmm. CNN and, and the news media talk about how devastating uh, this Hurricane Maria oh, this impact was. What were you fearing uh, I was as fearing you boarded that. a plane going, going home? And uh, what did you... But, you know, having first. had the opportunity to speak with family members, yes. my aunt, my husband's aunt, uh, families that live there, a little bit less challenged than the other ones that were on the inside of the island, um, they would let us know. We got mm -hmm. lines. We don't have lines. They mm -hmm. come and go. Sure. My aunt, for example, in Vega Baja, she was uh, without lights for almost three months. Wow. And then they came on and they'd go off again. Mm -hmm. um, she said, when we told the Titi we're on our way, what can we bring? She said, bring me some coffee. She just needed a cup of coffee. And that's, so um, I was not surprised to see that, that that was happening in the interior of the island. Mm -hmm. When we got to Puerto Rico, um, the airport was, you know, fine. And uh, 
anybody that had a generator mm -hmm. was doing well on the island. Mm -hmm. You had a generator, you had lights, you mm -hmm. had food, refrigeration. Sure. They were fine. Yeah. And so the A, B, and Bs and the tourists mm -hmm. were doing very well. They and were organized for they it. Were, yeah, yeah, prepared. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But ordinary people. No, yeah, they, yeah. they were suffering. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the children, um, we went, schools were closed. Mm -hmm. Schools were, um, teachers had left came to the Americas, you know. Um, so when we went into the schools, the Twin Cities Mobile Jazz Project gave us instruments that we could take to them. Wow. Oh my God, that was so great. Mm -hmm. We had mm -hmm. several musicians that went with us, mm -hmm. Maria Isa, mm -hmm. and uh, we gave them the, the instruments. They were just in awe, mm -hmm. and it was so nice. And the day that we got to the school, one of the, um, the school's lights had gone out, their toilets were gone, it was just a mess. But the, when we brought in those uh, music, the, the, the musical instruments, the children were so happy, and mm -hmm. it kind of like took away a little bit of that pain that they sure. were suffering. Sure, sure, music does that. Sharing and caring and giving does mm -hmm. that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I just remember how uh, a lot of the discussions that were held then and that continue t today uh, look at and criticize our government's response. And from my point of view, uh, you know, we deserve a failing grade for addressing the gravity of the issue. And what I discovered is a willingness to turn away from or even to blame the victims of the natural disaster. It's almost as if uh, our country's attitude was almost as if the, uh, the people of Puerto Rico, American citizens, yeah, yeah. created the disaster yeah. because they wanted a handout. Crazy. It's so Crazy. sad. It's and so ins sad. insulting, but racist. Absolutely. From my point of view. I don't know how, what's the discussion like? Absolutely, it was racist. Mm -hmm. it, and it was something that is degrading. Mm -hmm. You know, like um, the Puerto Ricans have always felt proud mm -hmm. about their mm -hmm. citizenship, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, we felt, wow, we're Americans, yeah, you right. know, and, and we came and left the island and came to the United States and go back and forth and the le contributions. Le lead, the, lead the nation in military service. Yeah. You know, with honor yeah. and valor, <laughs> absolutely. So when this came down on us, it was like we were waiting to see the response mm -hmm. and see it being better nurtured. But no, he came and threw paper towels to the people mm -hmm. and thinking mm -hmm. that, I don't know what he was thinking. Mm -hmm. And then also the lack of response, mm -hmm. you know, and blaming the, the debt crisis mm -hmm. that Puerto Rico is suffering mm -hmm. to the people. And the people had no right to that right. debt. It was right. a governmental debt. That's right. You know, and then they privatized and they bought all these uh, bonds and structures and they infiltrated, you know, mm -hmm. our, our economic system. Mm -hmm. And so the people being blamed mm -hmm. for that debt and the people that were suffering were not the ones that should have been blamed That's or suffering. Right. That's right. I'm Alan McFarland. My guest is Elsa Vega Perez. She is the leader of El Fondo Boricua Advisors. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, has the mission of continuing efforts to restore, uh, to heal uh, from the disaster of Hurricane Maria uh, in uh, 19, 2017. Yes. Uh, that impacted the Caribbean in general, but Puerto Rico mm -hmm. very specifically. And one of the things you're doing now just to keep the information going is partnering with organizations like the Ordway yes. to bring in one of the masters of music to yes. focus and to bring joy to our community here. Talk about the visit of Eddie Palmieri. Absolutely. Eddie Palmieri is a legend of Puerto Rican music. He is known um, for his great Latin jazz mm -hmm. and, and all his musical works, Grammy Award winner. When I spoke with his son, Eddie Jr., about you know what had been happening and how was Eddie and because we're friends, and I told him about our work with El Fondo, and he says, you know, awesome. Let's see if we can get Eddie out there. Mm -hmm. And so for a really reasonable cost, because mm -hmm. he charges a lot yeah. in Minnesota, you know, yeah, we don't yeah. have the population, but mm -hmm. he agreed to, to help us come, and he's coming May 19th mm -hmm. to the Ordway. And um, it's a great event. After his expenses are met, and they're really just reasonable, the, mm -hmm. the funds, remaining funds, mm -hmm will go to El Fondo Boricua. Mm -hmm. All those uh, tickets that we can sell, hopefully mm -hmm. we can fill the house, mm -hmm. we can certainly then pay Eddie and his mm -hmm. 14 band musician, because yeah. he's bringing a full salsa band. It's a big band. <laughs> it's a big band, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it's gonna be a great night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, that should be wonderful. Well, uh, he's got a stellar career as a musician, a band leader, and an, a cultural force, uh, both in Puerto Rico and in, in the world, I think. And so I think, uh, you know, America, all of us who are here will uh, uh, 
just uh, revel in uh, this exploration of, of Latin jazz and salsa. Yes, indeed. Uh, it'll be great. W what else are you doing to keep people plugged in? Yeah. Uh, what else can people do? What can our listeners do to support El Fondo? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's a donor base. They mm -hmm. can visit our website at mm -hmm. elfondoboricua.org mm -hmm. and they can make a donation. They could see where our money has been going. All the funds that uh, go towards efforts for Puerto Rico do not include administrative fees. Mm -hmm. It has to go to the project. Mm -hmm. um, people that may know of a nonprofit, they should call us and let me know, you know, what that nonprofit is and we can vet them through mm -hmm. the foundation and they can request a grant. Mm -hmm. So all the uh, foundation will vet the organizations. They have to be a 501c3. And if you are working with recovery efforts, we're ready. Great, great. Talk a bit about uh, Minnesota's Puerto Rican community. Sure. Uh, Soto Rica, right? Soto Rico. Yeah. Soto Rico. Soto Rico. Okay. <laughs> That's my daughter, uh, my son. Maria Isa. Yeah. Yeah, her term. Yeah. But talk about the community because it's, it's got a history. It does. It's got a rich history. Yes, it does. We have been, well, since I've been here over 46 years, mm -hmm. we have seen the growth of the Puerto Rican community and we've also in integrated our culture into mm -hmm. many of the things, the Ordway, the neighborhood house. Mm -hmm. uh, we started organizations, El Alcoiris, which is a performing dance company. We have advocacy efforts, Boricuas in Minnesota, Puerto Ricans in Minnesota. So you could see a large group of Puerto Ricans that are serious about mm -hmm. continuing the efforts to build Puerto Rico, to educate about Puerto Rico. One of the things, one of the components in the um, Ordway is during the, pre before the show, there'll be an exhibit of Puerto Rico with mm -hmm. artists mm -hmm. and also an understanding of where we stand with Puerto Rico. There's three issues that we're concerned about. It's the environmental issue, which mm -hmm. is a general issue that affects the entire society. Mm -hmm. It's we have natural resources and need protection. We also have the Jones Act, which is an outdated uh, regulation that keeps Puerto Rico from prospering to activate their 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 ports and mm -hmm. and, and those that means shipments. nobody can ship directly into no. Puerto Rico they have to come to a US port <coughs> before exactly. they ship goods and services which means the prices are sky high exactly and it suppresses trade free trade in a a place where free trade ought to be as available here as it is anywhere else in the country. There you get it. But we're locked out, right? And this there's is three, like three majors, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and Alaska mm -hmm. are subjected to those terms. Mm -hmm. And they really shouldn't be because it doesn't really help them to mm -hmm. sustain themselves and keep mm -hmm. them mobilized. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one of the concerns. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is the La Junta, which is what uh, President Obama tried to compose to deal with the debt crisis. Mm -hmm. No one's Puerto Rican on that board. Mm -hmm. okay. There aren't any you know, people living on the island on mm -hmm. that board. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to see how we can best reconstruct that mm -hmm. and see whether they're willing to at least integrate that and make it more reasonable so that people can participate in, in that form. What has happened with the uh, longstanding debate over decades over whether statehood or whether independence? Can I ask you to talk about that at all? Absolutely. Just give, you, give, you, give me an assessment. I'll give you my opinion. Yeah, you know, sure. sure. Um, Puerto Rico, the statehood issue is still debatable. Mm -hmm. Every time it has reached a referendum, the nationalists and the status quo want to keep it as the status quo, so they override the, the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the position for statehood. I don't want statehood, personally. Mm -hmm. I think that Puerto Rico could survive. Mm -hmm. I think we could certainly build relationships with the USA mm -hmm. and keep us in the forefront, but I would love it to keep its own nationality, its own language, and it, it really could survive. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if it's given the right resources mm -hmm. in support of, of, of a survival. Okay, okay, great, that's a good. Good answer, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, what else is uh, Fondo working on? What other projects do you have going right now? Right now, it's just basically helping fund uh, okay. the projects that are out there. We plan to make another trip probably next fall, September, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just to see where the rest of the funds. One of the things that now that they are in recovery stage, and some have recovered well, um, we're now looking at helping build infrastructure, mm -hmm. solar panels, uh, water streams mm -hmm. in those communities that really suffered the most. And so that's where our funds are being raised to help build those communities. 
Let's give people the uh, phone number or the email address or the website one more time yes. so they can connect and they can support because anybody listening or watching yes. can be a part of the solution. Absolutely. This is about creating a community of solution makers, right? And that's really what we're looking forward yeah, to, yeah. to educate people that Puerto Rico is part of this country, we're citizens of mm -hmm. this country, and that we should build relationships, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And our website is uh, www fondo, E-L-F-O-N-D-O, Boricua, B-O-R-I-C-U-A, mm -hmm. dot org, elfondoboricua.org. Okay. okay, Elsa, thank you so very My much. My pleasure. Good Al. to see you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Good, good. So, I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Remember this important work. Uh, you know, as I'm saying, uh, we're building community together, uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, um, you know, uh, sort of a family by family. Yes, and we owe it to each other to be the best that we can be for each other. Join us again next time for another edition of Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, first, thanks to our sponsor. Our sponsor is North American Bank. Thank them for their support of the organization. My guest today is Dr. Inel Rosario. Dr. Rosario is a board certified ear, nose, and throat surgeon and sleep medicine specialist. She's the owner of Andros ENT and Sleep Center, Andros at Audiology and Andros Med Spa. Born in the Bahamas, she came to the U.S. to attend McAllister College in 1983 and subsequently attended University of Minnesota Medical School and the Medical College of Wisconsin for her ENT residency. Her clinic is named for uh, the island, uh, the Andros Island in her native uh, Bahamas. She's all about heritage and that's one way of reflecting and honoring the heritage that has uh, given her wings to fly. At her clinics, she sees both pediatric and adult patients and has a sleep lab on site. Dr. Rosario and her staff aim to treat all patients with the same care and respect they themselves would like to receive. She calls that my kind of care. Dr. Rosario, thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, you're doing uh, such a phenomenal uh, uh, work in connecting around your specialty. Uh, describe, first of all, the work uh, of uh, the Andros Clinics. So the main clinic is the ENT and Sleep Center. And especially living in Minnesota, you get a lot of issues with sinuses, with ear infections, with sore throats. And so a big part of our business is managing the ear, nose, and throat health of people. Mm -hmm. So um, everything from ear infections in kids, which is important to manage and treat, not just from a pain standpoint, but from a lit language acquisition. So if they're not hearing as well, then they're gonna be behind in speech and language. So paying attention to that. And from a tonsil adenoid standpoint, um, looking to see are they having issues with infection or are they having issues with sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, it's been in the news, it's no secret at all. When kids are having issues with adenotonsil hypertrophy, they're much more inclined to have neurocognitive issues and that can be everything from behavior as far as hyperactivity, attention deficit, but you get the other end of the spectrum too where they will have more issues for anxiety and depression because they're not sleeping well because their tonsils are obstructing the airway. We'll also see that manifested in their facial growth and development where they'll have more issues with malocclusion. Mm -hmm. We do the sinuses and allergies. The sleep medicine is you know, right in there, very near and dear to my heart because I truly believe it all starts with sleep. Mm -hmm. If you're not sleeping well, nothing else works, whether it's your blood pressure, your you know, hypertension management overall, your cardiovascular risk. So, and then I have the med spa, of course, where everybody's got to look good. So <laughs> um, we do some of the more fun things there, so mm -hmm. to speak. I saw a flyer earlier, oh, here it is. Let me look yeah. at some of the things that you're presenting. In uh, the med spa, Andros Med Spa, 
uh, and you're actually having a, an open house yes. uh, in a few days, uh, April 11th, I think, uh, 4 to 11 o'clock. And uh, four to eight. Four to eight, eight o'clock on mm -hmm. April 11th. Thank yes. you for correcting me on yeah. that. Uh, but talk about the uh, products and services, the business of the Andros Med Spa. So I started the business uh, four years ago, mm -hmm. and the, a big part of it, uh, obviously being a female, being I look like this, an African American woman, trying to find products that actually I think look good on me, and as well being able to service multiple different racial ethnicity was a big part of that. Mm -hmm. um, Every man and woman want to look good and also wanting to have a little bit of control in the mm -hmm. ethics of it so mm -hmm. that really focusing on having a place where people can go and get the answers mm -hmm. without feeling any pressure to buy mm -hmm. or that they're being talked up in what to mm -hmm. purchase, mm -hmm. but you know, just straightforward. Mm -hmm. And our motto there is enhance rejuvenate and create your beauty where really want to take that person and make them the best of themselves and more confident to do whatever they're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and my goal always is that nobody knows what you had done. So if you had your lips done and I can tell you had your lips done, you had it overdone in my opinion. Okay. So wanting to keep people looking very natural. So we carry- So you do the surgery? I do the procedures. And when, when it's done by you, you won't know it's been done. Correct, that's okay. my goal. Okay. I also have a really talented um, nurse injector that works with me, Heather Lance, and she's also, same philosophy, we want to do it and not have people know that you had it done. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, what happened? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You look refreshed. Mm -hmm. And that, when my clients come back and tell me that, then I know I've um, accomplished my goal, that they look great. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So just kind of that younger version. Yeah. Um, so it's not just vanity anymore. It's really uh, just becoming your best self. Absolutely. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with vanity either, I think. No, we need more of that. Uh -huh. I think if we had more of that, mm -hmm. um, people would pay more attention right. to their exercise, their mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. and um, would live longer and mm -hmm. live better lives. And hopefully we would have less issues for anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you hit the gym as opposed to mm -hmm. kind of focusing too much on what the problems are. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah. Okay. And we carry all the SkinCeuticals, Skin Medica. we carry the Zoline from mm -hmm. Obagi, we have Cool Sculpting, we have True Sculpt. <laughs> pretty much anything you need for looking better, we carry. Are your businesses all located, co-located, or separate locations, or how do they work? The med spa is in a separate location mm -hmm. in the village in Mendota Heights, mm -hmm. and the ENT clinic is in Invergrove Heights, mm -hmm. um, right off um, 52 and 494. Okay. Yeah. And so the ENT clinic has the other two businesses? Correct. Or? The ENT clinic has the audiology mm -hmm. uh, department and as well the sleep lab. So we have an overnight sleep lab. So, so I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, your entrepreneurship, number one, but also just the, uh, the, the field of medicine that you've chosen. How did you choose the field of medicine? And uh, as you were doing the study, preparing to become a doctor, a physician, a surgeon, uh, was there also a uh, commitment emerging to entrepreneurship? So the, for the medicine part of it, growing up in the Bahamas, I grew up very poor. Um, I didn't see it as underprivileged because I didn't know any better. And um, I've always you, you just thankfully, had, what, had what you had. That's I had all. what I had. Yeah. That yeah. was it. And thankfully, I've never had the mindset of being poor. And um, I worked hard always and was reasonably smart. And so when I uh, came to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, wanted to go to college, a big part of that was I definitely want to make myself better, make my family better. And I thought I'd go to medical school. Mm -hmm. And in being in medical school, always knew I wanted to do something surgical. I liked doing things with my hands mm -hmm. uh, on the wards. I was great at doing needles and mm -hmm. everything else. And so looked at neurosurgery versus something else. And neurosurgery was the draw because I had a sister that had a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And I always thought the doctors were so arrogant. It's like, okay, I'm 12, but you could tell me it. I'll understand it. Mm -hmm. 
And um, so I wanted to make sure that when I talked to my just patients. just that you wouldn't get it. I wouldn't get it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so when I talk to my patients, I always want to make sure that even if they're a three-year-old that I'm doing tonsils on, mm -hmm. I talk to their level. Mm -hmm. But anyway, going back to choosing neurosurgery, um, they didn't really have a life outside of medicine, and mm -hmm. I wanted to have a life. So then I thought, well, I could be an ENT doctor and work with the neurosurgeons. Mm -hmm. And of course, I do generally ENT. I do mm -hmm. work with them sometimes, mm -hmm. but that's how come I chose ENT. Of mm -hmm. course, it was a little difficult because I didn't realize how much snot is involved. So we really are the booger doctors, <laughs> and so real for snot. a while, <laughs> real snot. Yeah. So I yeah. and I always tell the patients, you can just tell me about it. You don't have to bring it in. Right. So I was like, Doc, look at what I blew out. Yeah. Like, thank you very oh much. No thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's how I ended up with ENT. Mm -hmm. This more wanting to be surgical, wanting to be head and neck, mm -hmm. and then I thought neurosurgery would require too much personal time, mm -hmm. like they couldn't see a commitment outside of that. Being an ENT, it's definitely the right specialty for me. Right. It is so varied. Um, most people don't realize that mm -hmm. your plastic you surgeons yeah, are yeah, yeah. ENTs for the most part for your head and neck, so mm -hmm. I can do the cosmetic side, I can do the not so fun side with cancers mm -hmm. and yeah, everything I say nipples up, I'm mm -hmm. fair game. Okay, so, so yeah. then when did you decide uh, and how did the entrepreneurial path sort of envelop uh, your, your desire to be a physician and a surgeon? It was definitely always just the medicine. Okay. The entrepreneurial side started in residency as far as um, like looking at the different models or structures of mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to have as few barriers as possible between me and the patients. Mm -hmm. And so even when I came right out of residency, I worked in a private practice group and then from there started my own. Mm -hmm. uh, my family history on obviously a different scale. Mm -hmm. I have a sister that sells fruits in the Bahamas and I have some patients that have, because uh, she's right on the main street in Bay, on Bay Street, so I have some patients that have taken pictures with her and gone, hey, here we are with your sister. <laughs> uh -huh. So, and I have a brother that owns a business there. So my family have always been um, entrepreneurial mm -hmm. on their own level mm -hmm. of um, selling and providing mm -hmm. and not waiting. As a little kid growing up on Andros Island, mm -hmm. I, but strangely enough, don't know how to swim very well because I was the youngest. And so as the youngest, my role was to stay home and count. Uh -huh. And so counting means my brothers and sisters would go out, fish, um, get crops, mm -hmm. but in particular the fish and mm -hmm. the um, turtles. Mm -hmm. And we, would, as we lived in Mars Bay, the very last settlement. Mm -hmm. So we would have all the turtles lined up on the road and my job was to number them. And the guy would come down in his truck mm -hmm. and I would give him our order of huh. here's how many turtles and fish we're sending to Nassau where they would sell. Sure. So then I knew how much money we came, wow. would, would be expected <laughs> okay. to come back. Okay. So that was my role and the older kids went out and fished. So mm -hmm. I learned to count and mm -hmm. be responsible right away. So maybe my entrepreneurship started mm -hmm. then. Yeah, yeah. So. That's a great story. And, and so uh, advice to mm -hmm. people in our community uh, on a couple of levels. Uh, one, uh, just to pursue, I think, STEM training, mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering, mm -hmm. uh, the technical knowledge that you've developed as a um, mm -hmm. physician. How important is it to prepare for that and how uh, should we uh, talk about uh, embracing opportunities in arenas like that, that's number one. And then the same thing about business entrepreneurship. I'm interested in encouraging our people to begin to see ourselves as entrepreneurs, as mm -hmm. business owners, so that we define ourselves that way. What do you think? Absolutely agree that we need to do more and part of the reason why I'm here. And um, over the past 22 years that I've been in the state, I've been doing this all along, trying to get the word out there. I've gone to everything from grade schools to tell kids, here I am, ask me a question about being a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, believe it or not, the number one question I always get is, how old are you? Mm -hmm. Because people believe, well, if you're a doctor, you have to be old and you have to look mashed up or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. and you're not so real. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was at um, uh, one of the schools in St. Paul, and that was, 
I think the half hour of questioning yeah, for how, part how, of it. How old are you? Right? Yeah, because so they, yeah, they yeah. don't believe that you could go through all the schooling. So the schooling is not bad. But mm -hmm. anyway, I think that um, for uh, kids that are interested in medicine, certainly looking at the STEM product, uh, programs that are out there, mm -hmm. Um, but overall, just being involved in your community mm -hmm. and doing your homework. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, you've got a balanced life that it's not all play. Um, sports, I think, is really, really important mm -hmm. to participate in. It really helps you to be able to balance mm -hmm. the work in college and um, your schoolwork. And it also teaches you to fail because your team is not going to win all the that's time. Right, right. And so you figure out how to rebound and rebound again. Mm -hmm. And that's the same is true in business because even when um, your business is going great, not every aspect is going to go great. Right. And having had that idea of I failed at something and I had to pick myself back up Keep again yeah. and start over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I always tell I told my kids too <laughs> that life is very much like basketball. Mm -hmm. Which sport did so, you play? Uh, so I ran track. Ah. I was a runner. At McAllister? Uh, no. <laughs> before, before. And uh, McAllister, I was way too type A, like, let's <laughs> study, we're going to pay, we're going to pass this. Um, in call, in uh, high school and junior high school, okay. I ran the 100 and the 200 and the 400. Probably my best was the 100. What's your so. vision, what's your, your long-term vision for your company? I'll have you close on this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what do you want uh, the Andros system to e emerge into Andros Med Spa uh, and uh, the other companies, uh, uh, your um, Andros Audiology and Andros ENT and Sleep Center. What's the big picture? What's the big vision for you? Uh, big picture is to get a partner and expand. Mm -hmm. I would love to take our model of very hands-on, direct patient care, um, educating patients to multiple areas in the state and even to other um, 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 states mm -hmm. and have that same model where patients know that they're gonna come and receive the education that mm -hmm. they need about their health care so that they are participating in the health care. Um, I, I think uh, my biggest compliment was from a patient that was in a car accident and was having some orthopedic issues mm -hmm. and came to the front desk to make an appointment and the front desk is going, no, Dr. Rosario doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. And she said, I know she doesn't, but she will tell me who I should see. Where to go. She, she will get to the bottom sure, of it. Sure. And you know that's the kind of care that I'd like us as a group to be able to expand and have multiple other clinics that just listen mm -hmm. and you know service the patient, educate them. Super. Dr. Anil Rosario, thank you so much for being here. You're it's welcome. been a wonderful interview. Good to Good. meet you. Good. And I look forward to learning more about your services to collaborate with you uh, at Insight News and through our Insight to Health Fitness Challenge. There are some Great. ideas I think we can do together. Mm -hmm. uh, let me remind people that uh, your, uh, your new, not so new, but the Andros Med Spa yes. is located at 750 Main Street. Is Correct. that it? Yeah. Uh, suite number 109 in Mendota, Mendota Heights, uh, Minnesota. And the phone number is 651 222 3127. That's 651 222. 3127. There is a spring open house coming up uh, from 4 to 8 p.m. on Thursday, April 11th. Come by, check yeah. you out, and see what's going on yes. there. We'll have food and, and wine. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank yeah. you so much. Great. Great. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Let me say that uh, to me, this, in, this conversation is so important simply because we, uh, again, focus on this question of, uh, of um, uh, self-reliance and entrepreneurship in our community. And I think what Dr. Rosario is presenting is a model for quality uh, care for yeah. business that works. She says, uh, she calls it my kind of care. And she's also talking about replicating that and recognizing our ability as, as community to be entrepreneurial and to serve ourselves and to do that and make profit at the same time. Mm -hmm. So doctor, thank you so very much. You're very welcome, right. my pleasure. I'm Al McFarland, this is Conversations with Al McFarland.
I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest today is mm -hmm. Deneen Richberg. Uh, she's the founder of Brown Body, a fascinating organization, <laughs> a phenomenal mission. Uh, Deneen Richberg grew up as a competitive figure skater, uh, spending time in spaces where she felt she had to check her racial and cultural identity at the door. Uh, as the world of competitive skating was immersed in an ideology that excluded her ancestry's truths. Mm -hmm. So she worked up and, and grew in this space, and uh, she quotes Zora Neale Hurston, saying that she always felt most colored when she was thrown against a sharp white background. So as Deneen got older, she realized she needed to carve out a space for herself and her ancestral history. She brings that to the organization Brown Body. Brown Body is grounded in African diasporic mm -hmm. perspectives. It builds artistic experiences that disrupt uh, biased narratives and prompts audiences to engage as active participants in the journey. Mm -hmm. It blends modern dance, theater, social justice, and skating. It's been operating since 2007 bringing stories and topics important to diasporic communities from the peripheries of mainstream consciousness to the center stage, thereby expanding horizons, changing perspectives, and making the ice a welcoming place to communities of color. Deneen, that's a phenomenal story. Deneen oh Richburg, thank you for being with me today. Oh my today. goodness, thank you so much for having me. Well, I, I remain fascinated mm -hmm. uh, by the energy you bring, the uh, strength you bring, mm -hmm. the joy that you mm -hmm. bring to uh, commanding mm -hmm. uh, that this space is our space as well. Talk yeah. about that. What does yeah, that mean for you? Definitely. Well, you know, as mentioned, I'm really interested in dispelling popular and toxic mythology and stereotypes associated with blackness that seem to permeate all facets, all corners of mainstream consciousness. And so, um, and, and growing up skating, you know, um, I started skating when I was five. Skating to me is almost like breathing. It's just something that I do, and I feel like everything that I do off the ice, I can also bring to the ice and do on the ice. And so this work to really dig deeper and really cultivate a deep and honest and nuanced understanding of who I am as an African American, uh, the work that I'm doing uh, doing that off the ice is something that very naturally uh, for me I, I bring on the ice and so um, I want people I want other uh, individuals of, of varying there's so such a wide array of, of African-American communities here in the Twin Cities and abroad um, I feel like there's so much power in who we are and so I'm interested in bringing us mm -hmm. on that journey whoever wants to join me um, the, the ice arena doors are open as far as, as I'm doing, concerned you've got space downtown so yeah far. Oh my gosh, we're so space. lucky. Uh, talk about that first yeah. of all. How do people connect and join yeah, and participate? Exactly. Sort of plug into the the, uh, the joy yeah. that you've got Oh here. gosh, yeah, definitely. So, uh, well, first I just want to say we are very um, grateful and honored to receive support from the Knight Foundation mm -hmm. uh, to do a two-year pilot donation-based Learn to Skate program. And um, right now, uh, we, we have eight weeks in the spring that we're doing and eight weeks in the fall. We are in the middle of our eight-week spring session. Uh, we uh, will start up uh, the second half of our eight-week spring se session on April 23rd. It's 6 to 8 p.m. at the brand new, it's a gorgeous facility, Tria Rink. It's the Minnesota Wild Practice Facility. And so we're very fortunate uh, to be in that space. We have two hours of consistent ice every Tuesday from 6 to 8 p.m. And um, if, if people are interested, they can definitely go on our website, brownbody.org, and register. What's um, the range yeah. of people that can yeah. get involved? Is it for kids? Is it for adults? So is it, who's great, it for? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, four and up. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can stand, <laughs> you can skate, <laughs> you can skate yeah. pretty much. Yep, exactly. Uh, six to seven is for the four to 12 year olds, mm -hmm. and uh, seven to eight is for 13 and up. However, we do understand. You know, it's, it's sometimes people can't get off of work in time to get their kids there, so we make it work. You know, come whenever you can. We're, we, we're having a lot of fun, and we're really fortunate to have um, all black instructors, all black professional 
figure skaters uh, instructing the Do you lessons. have to work to undo mythologies in our people? Yes. Because, uh, yeah. you know, I'm from Kansas City. Mm -hmm. uh, good winter, and there was some yeah. ice skating that my relatives did. But mm -hmm. when we moved from Kansas City to Minnesota, mm -hmm. ice skating became a big, big deal because yeah. it's so cold it is. and there's so much <laughs> ice, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's wonderful to have the yeah. ability to learn and to enjoy yeah. the exhilaration that ice skating brings to you. Yeah. But what kind of myths and barriers yeah. are internal? Self-imposed, what have you found? Definitely, well, representation is always key. Mm -hmm. Because there are relatively few, at least within figure skating and, and hockey and speed skating, relatively few um, black folk represented mm -hmm. in um, kind of the, the more visible aspects of those sports. Oftentimes, that sends the message that, okay, this is not a space that is intended for black folk. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, growing up, I did receive that message pretty loud and clear um, frequently while I was enduring, um, or I shouldn't say enduring, but while I was uh, going through my competitive career. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, after judges and coaches and officials um, saw me and saw that I, I wasn't going to go away, um, things began to, to change. And I, I do have to say, not everybody was um, right. negative. I, right. There were some really amazing and beautiful folk and beautiful spirits mm -hmm. around me while I was growing up and competing that, you know, helped me and encouraged me to keep going. Um, but there was definitely that energy uh, within kind of that traditional figure skating space that was, um, you know, that it was, it was challenging and difficult for me to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. When did you develop the love yeah. for ice skating personally? What yeah. You started when? I started and, and how did you start? Did your mom push you, your dad push yeah. you? Or what happened that got you on the ice? So this is a great, great question. Um, so I started when I was five. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that I just had too much energy as a child, <laughs> and my parents were probably trying to channel that. Um, but my parents had me try a myriad of different activities and mm -hmm. sports. Anything, t-ball, soccer, any of that stuff, like the, the concept of having to get your enjoyment from a ball that you would either chase or try and catch or run after was not interesting to me <laughs> okay. by any means. And so, um, so figure skating, um, because there was that sensation of being able to, to skate really fast and have that sensation of flying across the ice, that stuck. And that was um, ever since you know the age of five doing learn to skate lessons myself. Mm -hmm. I was just, I was done. I was like, this is it. When did you know that you were good? Did, was Ooh, there, that's a good was there one or have there been several aha moments yeah. in your career? Um, I would have to say, you know, I, I, I even struggle with that today. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, I don't know what it means to be good, okay. you know, or, or yeah. Um, but I know that I, I just deeply connect with the experience of, being on the ice and when I feel like I'm kind of in an emotional and almost spiritual alignment with if it's that I'm doing choreography or when I was younger when I was jumping or spinning when things align and it just feels like it's what I'm supposed to be doing and it's the right thing and I just get a, an immense sense of um, gratification from it that that's what still to this day keeps me going and keeps me on the ice. So I would call that kind of a cosmic um, yeah. alignment, Ooh, right? Yes. And so it's when everything yes. sort of uh, is harmonic yes. and uh, exactly. attuned. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, uh, there's both a freedom, yes. but it's a freedom associated with the doing yeah. and with what is happening. Mm -hmm. And so as you experience that freedom, yeah. mm -hmm. um, what, uh, where does your mind go? Yeah. And wh where does your body go? I, yeah. I think it's infinite, but tell me yeah. how it sounds to you. I, I think it's definitely infinite. I, mm -hmm. I recall there was one really powerful moment I had. I lived in Philadelphia for almost 10 years, mm -hmm. and, and I was skating while I was there, but I was also pursuing my um, MFA and, and dance and choreography. And, and it was one of the first times when I'd started to bring some of the compositional and choreographic aspects that I was learning um, in school to the ice, and it just, it like blew open the bounds of skating for me. Mm -hmm. And I was having a spiritual experience. I remember I turned on some music. I, I think it was Astor Piazzolla, a tango, mm -hmm. a Libra tango, I think mm -hmm. that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And I just, I was just gone. I was, it's mm -hmm. like, I almost felt like I had an out of body experience wow. where I was just moving mm -hmm. to the cadence of the music mm -hmm. and my body was doing this movement and this footwork that I wasn't even thinking about it. It was just doing. Happening. It yeah. was just happening, and 
And so that, and, and I'm, I'm really grateful and fortunate to be able to have mm -hmm. those moments when I get on the ice, to continue to have those moments. And so, And so how yeah. does that experience, how do those moments translate into instruction yeah. for our people? Yeah. Instruction towards liberation, mm -hmm. instruction towards freedom, yes. instruction towards understanding that dignity yes. is at the core oh of goodness. our existence. Yes. Uh, how do you say that? What, exactly. How does it come out to you? For me, it's being given the space mm -hmm. to be a human being mm -hmm. with black skin. Mm -hmm. I, especially living in Minnesota, I'm just going to say this, I feel like 90% of the time I have to walk with a strong understanding and a realization that I am black mm -hmm. and that my mere existence and everything that I have to contend with and navigate is always in opposition to or um, taking into consideration another cultural way of being that is not mine. Mm -hmm. And so I can't have those transcendent, it's, it's challenging, mm -hmm. I guess I should say, for me to have those transcendent experiences when I'm always thinking about, okay, or I'm always just having to be aware of, sure. you know, okay, I'm, I, I'm a little bit on the outcast, I'm a little bit on the outside, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit this, I'm a little bit that, double, because the- Double consciousness, Yes, right? it's yeah. Du Bois double, con I mean, mm -hmm. 2019, it's still relevant. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I really pray and hope that one day that won't be relevant. Here's so. what I think, uh, Denine. I think that it won't be only when you have succeeded and we yeah. have succeeded in being our full and true selves. Yeah. And so that means that uh, there's a battle yeah. uh, that's unfolding and it's ahead. It's mm -hmm. one that we've come from, yeah. the one that we're heading towards as well. Yes. And it's one that we're in right now and that mm -hmm. battle is the battle to uh, claim and yes. live and thrive yeah. uh, as uh, authentic and genuine, fully formed human, human beings, beings Exactly. in an environment that yeah. attempts to deny and, and rob us mm -hmm. of the joy and beauty and luxury yeah. of who and what we are. Yeah. That makes sense to that you? That makes perfect sense. And so the fight exactly. doesn't end, No. but it's a fight worth fighting. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and I really firmly believe that it, it starts, you know, there's only, we only have so much power. So, or, or there's only so much change that we can um, uh, incite um, on our, our external world mm -hmm. and that we really need to, to start internally. And I, I feel like the more I, I um, love and, and, and experience gratitude for the multidimensional whole human being that I am, mm -hmm. the more um, I'm kind of armed mm -hmm. to, um, to exist within these spaces that are doing exactly what you, you just said. Mm -hmm. So I just want to create a space through the artistic work, through our Learn to Skate lessons, through we're starting um, an embodied training process um, um, for black folk, black communities, and, and I, you know, I, I can even, I think, I'm not sure, I wonder about extending it to black and brown communities mm -hmm. because I see it from the outside, it looks like I see people um, experiencing similar sure. um, challenges, but um, for black communities to start to, you know, to have that space, to start to cultivate mm -hmm. that really deep and authentic sense of of wholeness internally. And then, you know, the outside world is gonna do what the outside world is gonna do. And, and you know, we, um, you know we, we continue the struggle mm -hmm. and continue to fight, but we need to make sure that, you know, with ourselves internally that we are, that we are, we're whole and we're good and that, that we well, see, love I, I who we are. I believe the yeah. outside world will change. Yeah, and yeah, I that exactly. that is the power of us discovering there you go. who we yeah, are I love that. and what we are yes. and why we are in the mission that we're in. Yeah. And that gives us more fuel and more energy yeah. to complete, to compete and to uh, move with a certain joy. Yeah that is infectious, yeah. that is the change agent. That's yes. what I think it is anyway. I, I completely agree 100%. And, and I really feel like, um, you know, we have we, the, the treasures that exist within us all mm -hmm. that I just see continuing to get undermined or dismissed mm -hmm. um, by, uh, you know, a space that doesn't really even know how to appreciate and, and how to perceive uh, 
a, a black human being, um, it, it breaks my heart. And so I'm like, okay, let's, let's really kind of mine the treasures and the beauty and, and the resources that naturally and in, instinctively um, are within us. And we're, so. we're down the last uh, minute, minute. Okay. Go. So, okay. I've got, uh oh. Deneen, uh, two things. Uh, the word, the name, brown body. Yeah. And what's coming up? very soon that you exactly. want people to plug into. Perfect. I'm going to start with what's coming up very sure. soon because I will go off and then I won't <laughs> have that. Um, so we are very fortunate to um, be um, co-presented by the Walker Art Center and Northrop mm -hmm. um, in a performance coming up April 25th and 27th. We're presenting a works in progress or works in development um, 25 to 30 minute excerpt of a larger piece called Tracing Sacred Steps mm -hmm. where we are looking at uh, 17th through 19th century black social dance and we're starting with ring shout so we're bringing that onto the ice mm -hmm. and again it's a works in progress but really excited to Where will it, be? Um, it will be so April 25th will be at Breck Anderson Ice Arena okay, okay. at 4 o'clock mm -hmm. and April 27th will be at uh, Charles M. Schultz Highland Ice Arena okay. in St. Paul mm -hmm. um, at 5 o'clock mm -hmm. and tickets are free mm -hmm. so I really want uh, you know I just want to eliminate the financial barrier sure. there are times when I want to go to shows and play and I'm just broke as a joke and right. <laughs> like calling on favors and <laughs> sure. so but um, we do require that people reserve their tickets on sure. our website brownbody.org because seating is limited so, and yeah. the name brown body it's brown a body name. yeah what's, definitely what's so funny that actually um, a friend of mine and I were um, we were years ago we were going back and forth like hmm, if we had an organization what would we call it um, and actually he helped come up with that um, that name and so uh, but it wasn't it was like brown movement body we just and it just came together so. brown body I'm Al McFarland thank you so much my guest Deneen Richburg founder of brown body thank and you. it's a way to connect yourself your family your young people in particular with the universal beauty of discover discovering self, dance, art through the ice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Support for Conversations with Al McFarland was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company.